Well, I am so happy to have you on Bridges Live, and I'm Dr. Paul. Um, this is Bridges Live, and you are just now coming on with us, and welcome. Most of the people can hear us on iHeart, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and they can catch on my YouTube channel, um, Dr. Paul um, Dyer, Grandmaster, because if you didn't know, I'm a Grandmaster of Martial Arts, been doing martial arts for over 45 plus years, so wow. th- that is, um, I've been teaching around the world for a bit, and, and doing that stuff, and I believe in protecting and service to people. I think that's what we all have in common. But please tell us about yourself because I want to di- dug right in and people who don't know who Lashana Potts is, uh, okay. that's their fault. But now they're going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> so I am a 42-year-old um, African-American female. I've been in law enforcement now for 23 years. Um, I joined the department when I graduated from high school. Um, came from a long line of law enforcement officers, um, including my mother, who retired um, when I got on the force. Um, married. I have a 24-year-old daughter. And I'm just really, really interested in just continuing to strengthen the bond between community and police. And I try to do that with community involvement where I work, um, as well as outside and inside of the department. So, most of the people who have been listening to Dr. Paul for a little bit for a couple of years or whatever, I have nine kids, seven girls, two boys, seven grandchildren. I know the age. I got them all between here to there. And <laughs> so, um, raising women and, and strong women, and, and this is what's been such a blessing for, to have you on, is to talk about building strong women in our community but also learning how to serve our community in many facets. You chose to serve as a police officer and building that community because it is broken. Our community, the black community is broken. Men are broken. Women are broken. We're broken. (laughs) And that's why I do Mental Health Mondays because we need to say, I need some help. I need to fix myself before I can help fix my community. But with your service... Let's talk about that that journey that you are in now as a police captain, but for you to say, I'm going to serve. So I came from a single parent household. My mother was a single parent raising myself and my sister, and we grew up in poverty. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. It wasn't until my mother branched off into law enforcement that it allowed for us to kind of see a different world other than the world that we grew up in. And we grew up with with some challenges. You know, there was trauma in our childhood. Uh, My mother, trauma in her childhood, which then passed on trauma in in our childhood. So I knew early on that I wanted to be a person that would go out and see the girls that look like me, Mm -hmm. that came from backgrounds like myself, and let them know that they can make it. You know, that they can look to something other than the environment that they were born in. And so that kind of was what led me into servitude. Um, I knew early on that I wanted to be a service. I knew it was either being in law enforcement or being a lawyer. I ended up choosing law enforcement. I, but you got a little taste of both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the community is, um, I always say, you know, when people say it takes a village, right? Right. Um, to raise a child. But what do you do when a village is sick? So we have not, uh, you know... That's a great point, and you think with all the talking heads, I was out here on these mass, so these other media places, and I don't want to talk about them specifically. It's just that, what do we do? How do you how do you help a community that is sick? We have to recognize our sickness. I was just recently talking with Dr. George Frazier and and, and Demetrius Curry and, and D. Shopshire earlier today, and we have to recognize that we we have a sickness. In our community, and until we recognize that, it's going to stay broken. Absolutely. How do you fix something if you don't acknowledge that it needs to be fixed? You can't, right? <laughs> um, and I think it, just being in law enforcement, you know, I've seen the worst of humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen the worst in my culture, um, being in a predominantly black city. But I've also seen the best of our culture. So I, I know that there are way more good people in this world than there are bad. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes the good people feel silent. Because you do hear so much negativity. So in my course of day, I just try to bring something positive to anybody that I meet. If I can leave them better off than how they came when they met me, then I've done what I was supposed to do for that day. So it, 
now that young black girls and I hope young black girls are able to see you and and to say look what looks like me and I know before we went on air we we talked about I know some people say like the Michelle Obamas and there's nothing against her but we don't she's too high yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, that's too far up. My, my my neck hurts from looking at you know what I mean? So, but not that where you are isn't a high level position in the police force because you're a captain and it, that we'll talk about that, but that took its own self a road, but you're more at, on our level. Yes. Attainable. Yeah. You can you can see me at the grocery store. Right. <laughs> you can see me walking through the neighborhood. Um and I think we need more idols like normal people. And this is, like you said, this is not against um, Michelle Obama because, I mean, she's fascinating. It, you know, when, when you know about having a first lady, the first African-American first lady, I mean, that was huge, right? Was huge. But when I turn off the TV, what do I see in my environment? What's the neighborhood I'm walking through? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I think we need to see more of that. Um, I've been privileged enough to be a part of a program called the Sisterhood. And what it does is we go into high schools um, in our neighboring precincts and we mentor. We mentor those girls that are broken. Um, We have challengers and leaders in a group. And so we we want them to see us as human beings first, just me being in law enforcement. But, But secondly, as being a black woman who made it, who came through poverty, who had a mother who was a teenage mom, mm-hmm. who had all of the criteria that says that I should have been a failure and see that I did, I was successful and I am still successful and that they can be successful too. We just sometimes need the tools to be successful. Let me ask you something, Lashana. And, and when you started on your journey, and, and even though you may have recognized what your mother was going through, when did you de- when did you un- fully understood that you had to develop something up for yourself? I would probably say when I got pregnant in high school. Okay. So, um, my mother tried her very best to end that generational curse mm-hmm. of single motherhood. However, um, my sister and I both had children in high school. Um, When I had my daughter, it was like a light bulb went off. I I wanted to make sure that I gave her every opportunity to not fall into the same traps that I fell into. And that's when I decided that I got to change something about me. But it started with me realizing that I had not addressed the trauma in my childhood. There was there was trauma there that we didn't talk about in my family. Um, you know, it's, it's just one thing that we don't. You just kind of move on. Which is funny because in the black community, we don't want to talk about trauma or sickness at all. Like, I'm not going to that crazy person. <laughs> you, you go talk to auntie. We, we, because in our mental health Mondays and on my mental health panels, we laugh about it because the black culture is like, well, you, what are you crazy or something? I'm going to talk to that mm-hmm. shrink. No, I want, I want to be better. I want to be better. So I need to strip away all this stuff. And and let's look at it this way. If we're coming from post-traumatic slave, right, and all the stuff that has been done to the black community, why wouldn't we think we have trauma? I don't know. That That's a really good question. But when you ask us, you know, are we traumatized, most of us will say we're okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> I tell my I tell my officers all the time the worst thing that you can say every day is I'm good. Yeah. Oh. It, it, you know it, it's a catch all for not wanting to deal with whatever issues that you have because most hurting people if you look at them they'll say they're good. Yep. And they're dying inside. And and and, and in that dying and we know what our, our our communities around the globe. Um, served in the military, I did. So I look at our life as global. And then we have local because we have pain that stretches from sea to sea. And, and, and we seem to think that our pain is so special. Mm-hmm. How do we talk to our community that needs to recognize that it needs to be recognized? I try to meet people where they are. Yeah. You know, um, you can't just go in pointing the finger and telling people what's wrong with them. So I always try to start off telling them what started, what was wrong with me. Right. 
and the things that I fixed. And then you hope that in that conversation, they open up to some suggestions. Um, And you'll find that people want to talk about their illness or their pain. They Mm -hmm. just don't want to be judged. They don't want you to look at them differently. And I think in a community, um, we have to do better in a black community um, because I can only speak for being a black person. Right, right. We have to do a better job of making people feel comfortable and knowing that it's okay to not be okay. Right, and and, and we've and I've said that before. You know, once people and, and me and other ther- if, once we recognize and understand that it's okay not to be okay, then they will ask for help mm-hmm. because because the resources are here. It's not so much. And then once you understand that it's you, it's okay not to be okay. Then you might and I and I do pray and I, I do more than pray. I work at it and teach it. That you think that there's not an us and them. Yes. Because once you separate yourself between another, you're only going to create a friction. Yes. You got to be open to inclusion. That means any and everybody. You have to be. Um, you have to be okay with. Uh, we, we're in a, a, a multicultural um, country. Correct. So you have to be open and willing to allow yourself to get to know people of every race, people of every nationality, people of every religion. Um, And I think once we do that and stop being so closed off, that we'll grow. But but right now, black people are feeling isolated. With everything that's going on in America, we're feeling like we're isolated on an island by ourselves. And we're not. We have allies. Mm -hmm. They're they're everywhere. We just got to allow them to come in. And help us. So, in, like, when you talk about you and being a, a, a police captain in a major city, mm-hmm. when did you re, when did you see that you had allies, even in your systematic struggles that was faced that was pushed upon you? Because they had to. They, there, there's still a there's still a good old boys club. Let's not get it yeah. twisted. <laughs> there's still a good old boys club out there that's like, okay, here she comes and she's rolling. And and whether you recognize her or not, she's coming. So how did you feel like what did you how did you understand that you had allies and, and I was thankful um that I had women. Okay. Women of, of, of different races, women of my race that when I was going through elevation through the police department, they latched on to me. Mm. And they saw something in me that they wanted to nurture and mentor. So um, I was blessed to have that. Not everybody has that. You know, I had women that I could lean on that would tell me the experiences that they had um, being the first female in a unit or being the first captain or commander Um, of the Detroit Police Department and I just, I was like a sponge I wanted to know how do you navigate a male dominated white male dominated field because it still is, Detroit is an anomaly most departments are not like Detroit, most departments even when I go to training um, out of state it's usually I'm usually the minority in the room. <laughs> it seems like we always have that problem. No matter what education <laughs> level we are, no matter what area we went, every time we sit in a restaurant, sometimes we're in a restaurant. We're like, you know, we're the only black couple in this restaurant. <laughs> it's like what, what, what? <laughs> And then when you see another black person, you're like, it's the not the, the head not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I see you. So um, I didn't, you know, coming from Detroit, which we have a very high number of African American women in leadership um, that is not the norm across this country Mm. and when you go to different places and you talk to the women there and you find out there's only one you know out of her whole department um, you try to lend them some support you know even in Detroit I'm talking to women all across the country Yes, you know giving them support because it is a struggle even in Detroit where we have a high level of black women, it is still a struggle for women in leadership role. So, have, have you guys formed an organization for police women or police black? I mean, is there like a, a, a fraternal thing that you guys can chat with each other to strengthen this? We don't necessarily have a structure 
it's kind of like when you go somewhere and you see people that are like minded that are like you and you kind of gravitate towards each other and then you find out that you know they're in their department and they're only one of four Mm -hmm. um and then they find out from me that i'm one of 12 you know or one of 13 which is very high for a department to have that many black women in power roles um it's kind of like a off the record type thing but we do depend on each other because law enforcement regardless is still a very male dominated role um i have to be very careful of the tone you know how i speak i don't want to come off as being angry black woman so (laughs) i mean it's just it's something that that i consciously make an effort to to you know when i'm when i'm engaging especially when i'm dealing with men in law enforcement to make sure that I'm not coming off as being angry. Now, to be stern. For first of all, the whole angry black woman. I don't know. I, the black community can make fun of it, and it, and it could be like because they record, they see their mama somehow. And, mm-hmm. and I get that when your mama's yelling at you, be like, eh. and here and here's another <laughs> woman. But that's that's internal. It is. So how are we supposed to be cognitive of? external with someone else for them to perceive it that's because the white men and white women also see it angry black women how they get it like like where, why would they internalize that why do you turn on the tv and what do you see angry black woman you see angry black woman i mean <laughs> it, it, you you turn on songs you i mean it's it's everywhere and I, i'm i'm very cognizant of that of of the fact that I'm not only speaking for me, I'm speaking for black women in general. Yeah. You know, when I win, it's a win for black women coming behind me. Yes. If I come out there and I fail, I just set them back. So I'm very um, passionate about making sure that I always carry myself with, you know, dignity, integrity, um, be respectful. Um, I'm not a pushover by any means. So, you know, I, I can go there with people, but I always be mindful of what that's going to look like from the person looking on the outside. How can we build a better community between break down the us and them? From your standpoint, being in law enforcement, there is there's a wall. Mm-hmm. And the wall has been there for a long time. Even in my growing up in my years growing up, there's been there for a long time. Do you do you see the wall coming down or do you see it being understood? I see it being understood. I don't necessarily know, especially in the climate right now. Um, It it seems like there's more bricks being put on the wall. Um, But I think one of the things that I think we've been successful here in Detroit is we've been very, very passionate about retaining African-Americans in law enforcement. We've been very passionate about recruiting people from the neighborhood. And I think that makes a difference. I think that there is no other... You can't name a city where there's a a all white community that has an all black police force. No. However, yeah. you can name a whole bunch of communities yeah. that have all black neighborhoods with all white law enforcement. I think it's a discussion that has to be had and we have to be open and honest that in order for you to make sure that you don't have a Ferguson or or you know what's going on in Seattle and places like that is that you have people that look like the community that they serve. But then now we're we're going back to this other systemic issue that we can talk about, we have talked about, and there's been pontification about it all the time. Well, we have have low rate of success of graduating high school. We have even lower rate of getting into college or even graduating college. And we have even a lower rate of getting into advanced schooling. So where do we find those officers or those people who want to serve a community if they can't even get out of high school. So we have to get them at such a young age and saying, we want you to graduate, right? We want, we we were putting our hands on your back and saying, we want you to graduate because then we can say, we want you as teachers, we want you as nurses and doctors and uh, to serve your community. Now we know in African countries, when they come over here for the education, a lot of them go back. Why? Because they go back to serve their their home, their townships, and and their and their communities. We don't have anyone coming back. 
That's true. We have a lot of people in in my age of 50 (coughs) that ran away from the neighborhood. They're like, I got my education. I'm gone. You know what I mean? And and they're like, back where? I'm not going back there. You know what I mean? And and, and that was wrong. It is. It's wrong, but it, it happens every day because we've been ingrained in us that we have to leave where we grew up mm-hmm. in order to be considered successful. Um, I did it as well. You know, the, the first chance to um, move to the suburbs, that's what I did. Right. You, you know, I moved to the suburbs because that was the ideal um, scenario of knowing that I made it. Yeah. It, it was, yeah, it was it. your, it was the way you patted yourself on your back. Yes. 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 I work hard. Now I get to go, you know, and live in a suburban home. Um, you know, my daughter gets to go to a suburban school. Yeah. And, you know, I look back and was it the right decision? I'm not sure. I, I don't know. Yeah. It, it, it's a catch 22. Had mm-hmm. I stayed, um, you, you know, my issue was, you know, policing and being in the same neighborhood of the people that I locked up. You know, it started becoming a safety issue for it, us. It is a safety issue. Yeah. And and, and, so that, no. and speaking of safety issue, you're 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 in a safety situation now. I I, I don't know how I do my brothers and sisters out there who, you know, when people say congratulations for your service, when it, when somehow I I don't really even want to mention I served in the service, right? They say, well, thank you for your service. I say, well, I volunteered. And it's not to put them off for their thank you, but I did raise my hand. I remember, you know, you have a choice. Not everyone chooses the choice you make but when they put you in the room to take your oath it's it's kind of like huh I, I, I'm getting ready to do this yeah. <laughs> and, and some days you're like why did I do why did I <laughs> <laughs> why did I sign up again I, you know this wasn't part of what I thought this was going to be a part of I think people say thank you for your service even though we did volunteer um, it's a calling to want to do military and law enforcement um, the majority of police officers across this country have that in them where they want to give a mm. service. Um, and so I think when people do say that to us, it's, it's acknowledging that even though we volunteer, because I signed up as well, um, that not everybody is meant to do military or, or policing. It, you have to be a special individual to want to run to danger. Right. You just have to. The fire department running in, you know, all these service. And this is where we find also where it didn't seem like the United States in a whole cared about the people who served the people. And here's what Dr. Paul, why are you saying that? Because if we looked at it as in past tense, where we wanted the school teacher in our community, we built her house. Mm, yes. We, we made sure that she had a place to live next near the school. Well, you're just talking about 20, 19, 20, but that was the structure of our community. We wanted our priest or pastor or, or religious church. We built it. They stayed in the community. The sheriff stayed in the community. These are things that we can go back to because we're not paying police officers enough. We're not paying nurses enough. We're not paying teachers enough. Wait a minute. And these are the people that are serving us. Yes. So where, if, if, if you care that much, then why can't a police officer go to the, that bank and say, I'm, I'm a police officer. And okay, by the way, your house, we're really selling it for 350000 It's really one twenty five for you. Because the community would eat that cost because we want you here. Yes. I agree. Well, that I agree. That doesn't seem like that's a far-fetched thing to do. It's not, but somehow it is. Um, we haven't figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow we, we don't get enough teachers. We don't get enough yeah. police officers. We don't get enough firefighters. We don't get... And then we're whining and crying about who's protecting us. Yes. Like, yeah. like Chicago now. I, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I'll say post COVID, um, in every major city across this country, we've seen an increase in gun violence. Yes. Uh, um, it's it's just been even in the city of Detroit, it it's been astounding. And we're doing the job. You know, our officers are out here getting guns. They're making arrests, but as a society, it just appears that we may be getting more violent. 
as, as an emotional scientist, and what I mean by scientist is that I study emotions and behavior. Because t- teaching martial arts and teaching martial sciences, we, we really break you down and, and get into your spiritual act, your soulful act, your balance of your mind, your breath, and all combine it to one, right? That's the development of the art. Until individuals break that out of them and realize the anger and the trauma we, we talked about, Mm-hmm. Because that's what's coming out. I don't think we're becoming more violent. I think that trauma is surfacing. Mm, that's a good way to look at it. And in that surfacing, we every time a, a police officer pulls someone over, they're arresting the trauma. Mm. They're not even... Because I don't, I don't remember the last time I even got pulled over. But every time I was just talking to some people on a podcast, my heart races when a cop pulls up behind me. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I haven't done anything. I haven't done, but I'm. But my heart starts pe- beating, and I'm like, what, where does that come from? Where does that? It's 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 in my head. So if I do it, and Condoleezza Rice did it when she got pulled over, she was, and they were just they threw. You know, there was a whole big thing then. Just think about the people who aren't cognitive of their emotions and how it spews out of them in nothing but anger and frustration. Fear. Yeah, and fear. Absolutely. So I'm in law enforcement. My husband's in law enforcement. I grew up in law enforcement. And guess what? I still get nervous when I'm put over by law enforcement. It, you know, it, it, it doesn't stop because I, I put on a badge and, right. and, and wear a gun. Um, it's still a fear. There's a fear that something can go wrong, that maybe this is that cop's bad day. Right, right. Yeah, it, it's, it's a fear. It is a fear. Um, and I don't know how we change it. I think we have to talk about it. I think we have to be honest when, when we when we tell, especially our community. Yeah. When I talk to um, young black men and, and women in my community, I tell them when you're put over, this is not the place for you to hold court. <laughs> this isn't it's it. Not. This isn't it's it. Not. This is it. This isn't it. It's not going to end well. No. If you if you up your demeanor, they're going to up there. And and as a law enforcement officer, secure the scene. Identif- yeah, they don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. Yeah, yeah. So it's just it's a recipe for disaster. I think calmness and cooler heads have to prevail. But you know what? what I, because I, I can hear the yatter mouths out there already. Even when we do do it right, it still may not happen right. That's true. So, but I, your better chances are, people, is to still always be right. My mother used to say, "If you if you are right, you be right, you act right, that gives you half a chance." It does. <laughs> we know what happens if if, if we, we already know the end result. If you come out the gate mm-hmm. um, and you're already on 10, they're going to go up to 11 because we're always going to go up one more than what you're doing. Right. So, I mean, you have a better chance. And, and I'm raising, you know, black children. You have to they have to know that respect authority. That's mm-hmm. the first thing. Um, even when authority is wrong, you voice it after you get away. You voice it after you've received that ticket. Um, there's proper channels to make sure that that's addressed. But what you can't do is, is stand on a side and challenge. It just doesn't work. It doesn't go well. It just doesn't. Do we need more act- activists in our communities to want to teach how to be instead of what they need to be? Absolutely. Both more proactive than reactive. Right. In society, we're a little bit more reactive um, I believe that we need to see people, grassroots organizations uh, that, that are in a community that are working hand in hand with the with community. The citizens. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Because I don't think, I think we have organizations that have their own interests. Mm-hmm. They have their own interests. <laughs> I know where you're going. <laughs> yeah. And it's okay to have an interest, but yes. their interest is influencing our communities. Yes. And now our communities are looking different. Yes. And in that different, it, it there's that us and them. Yes. 
when, when in reality, aren't we all human beings? Yeah. When it's all said and done, everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. You know, we all have people that we care about, that we love, that we cherish. Um, I think we just have to go back to putting human in humanity. We have to get away from my life is better than yours. You're, you know, you're less than me because you make this much. Um, I'm Republican, you're Democrat, but we can't get along. I mean, I've seen people lose friendships over political opinions. Crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. You should be able to agree to disagree. And I think that's where if you're unable to agree to disagree or have a disagreement discussion uh-huh. and and I and I and I'm going to stand by this if you have a difficult time having a disagreement with someone that in itself sell, tells me how traumatized you are carrying internally with something now I can't. I don't. We won't know what that is until you go and get help and and talk to your therapist and talk and and break that out of you. But, but there's something that is rising up within your internal that is coming out and is putting you back into a corner of defense and fear. Absolutely. Um, what I notice in a community is a lack of conflict resolution. We're not taught, it, but we're not taught it. It, we need to teach it though it, we, it needs to be just as important as math yes. If not more important than math We need to learn how to have a disagreement Without feeling like we have to always be right Or that there's a disrespect If we're not right You know if you look at all of the Majority of the murders that are happening In, in, in this country Come from people feeling disrespected Yes Crazy Yes I mean, it just doesn't make sense. You're killing someone because they didn't agree. <laughs> or they ate the last piece of cake in a refrigerator. I mean, it's, it's, it's we have to go back to the basics of parents being parents. Um, a lot of it is, you know, I always, I talk about millennials and then the millennials look at me and say, well, you guys raised us. They're right. So, I'm like, Yeah. <laughs> So if you're messed up, then that means I did something wrong. Right. <laughs> And, and, and I have a, a men's mentoring group, and we talked about this on air. We dropped the ball. Mm-hmm. We we have to own up to our, our our bull and say we we were working. We had our heads down. We 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 got you your TV and your cable, yes. and we got you your game system because I never had a game system, but I was able to get you a game system. And I had my head down, and I was working this, and I was trying to do that, and I was putting on my hustle. And I didn't raise you. That's correct. The, and the internet raised our kids. Mm-hmm. The internet, um, a video games, and now we're wondering why our kids uh, are not socializing. They're getting a little better now. I'm noticing that they are getting a little more outspoken. But I notice even talking to my daughter, it's more of a texting thing. You yes. know, writing a letter or having a full conversation <laughs> on the telephone. Yeah, <laughs> she, she's like, Mom, just text me. Yeah. I'm like, but I want to talk to you. <laughs> Trust me. I go through it all the time, my kids. I, I text them. I have them in a group text, and I'll send some. Just want to say I love you and I miss you. I get nothing. I get nothing. I just get used to it. <laughs> no, I'm trying. It's hard. So you've been in law enforcement for how long now? 23 years. Okay. Now, this is a specific, direct question. There's a game out there. I've never played it, but I've seen it. And it's about it's it's a theft thing game. You probably know what ta- I'm talking about, where they get points for stealing a car. Mm. Um, Grand Theft Auto. Yes. Okay. Why is this allowed? Why haven't police officers around the world not allowed this thing to be a game? To where it puts into the the, the 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 small brains that's not fully developed this into their psychic. It is the most horrific game. I, I don't. I I am wow. Yeah, it makes it makes being a criminal glamorous, right? Right. Um, I, I think as law enforcement, we feel, and I'm only speaking for me, is that 
we're not supposed to regulate how you raise your children. But this that is, is up to it, parents. Right. right. You, you know, you it, that's up to you whether you allow your child to play uh, Grand Theft Auto. I know it wasn't allowed in my home. I, but I actually think this type of game puts police officers in danger. I, I, I think it could be made as a legal case that it has increased the danger for police officers. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with thinking that's going to go anywhere. You know, people want their uh, their rights, and they want the right to be able to play whatever game that they want to play, regardless of, of the data that shows that a kid growing up probably playing violent video games has a warped sense of reality. Yes. You know, they believe that once they fire that gun, they can just do a do-over. You can't restart the game in real life. It doesn't work like that. I I I I I was telling the person that when I was in the service, he says, "Oh, I want," and he was about twenty-two. He says, "I want to join the service." You, you're gonna laugh. I said, "So, what are you doing now to prepare for service?" He goes, "Well, I'm playing Seal game." I said, <laughs> "I said what?" He goes, "There's a game called Seal. It's a you go in." I'm like, "I I didn't, didn't even know anything about the game," and he's like. I said, well, how is that? He goes, well, it, it gets you, puts you into that. I said, I just have to walk wow. away. And right, right. Wow. Because if you want to be in the soldier, you want to be in the military, you want to go in foreign lands and, and join. Don't yeah, play the game. I like a steel game. Right. Definitely yeah. not like the video game. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not yeah, that's, that's what I mean. That's the reality, um, especially when you put that with alcohol and right. marijuana. Okay, yeah. You know, you're already stunting your brain cells, and now you're playing day in and day out games that make you feel inferior and then you go out here and you shoot someone or you rob someone and then reality sets in when when i come to lock you up and you go to prison for the rest of your life now you have all the time in the world in a box to figure out where did you go wrong when we can probably stop it before they get to that point before we sign off i want to thank you so much um Lashana Potts, Captain Potts. We have to build a better community. And you're serving the community. You're talking to the community. You're, you're being visualized in the community. And yet the community seems to either are sleeping on deaf ears or, or not responding. What can we do to help you? We that are listening, we that do hear you, we that do support you, we, what can we do? Because the others, we'll, we'll have to keep trying to wake them up. Yes. But, but the people who are helping and the we that is helping, what can we do for you? I would say just continue to be vocal. Okay. You know, continue to be supportive openly. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't do us in law enforcement any good if you're behind closed doors saying, we support law enforcement right. because a lot of times the noise that we hear are the agitators. And sometimes for us, we forget that there are people who do support us. You know, this is a very thankless job. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure, as you know, even in a military and in any service profession, sometimes you feel forgotten, you know, and you're made to feel like you're a robot who doesn't have any feelings, who don't get sad who don't get angry. Um, you know, as law enforcement officers, we feel very silent on what we can and cannot say for fear of saying the wrong thing right now. Um, and I would just say for the people who do support us, you can support law enforcement and be against police brutality. You yeah. can do both. You can do both. <laughs> you can do I both. I hope you can do both. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, come on. I mean, <laughs> you can do both. You like, have to take one or the other. Like, we, we, people can go to church and believe in Christ and not agree with the pastor because he's yeah. doing wrong. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> this is, yeah. And, this I, you know, that's what I would tell people. Um, get more involved in, in, in the community programs that your police department offers. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a plethora of police programs that are in the community in the Detroit Police Department. And a lot of times when I come up against people who are speaking negatively, I start asking them, do they know about the programming? A lot of people don't want to learn what's in a community because then it, it takes away the complaints. 
right? Mm -hmm. um, I would rather you do a ride along with me and find out what it's like to be an officer for those four hours that you're in a car with me so that you can see some of the things that I see. And maybe it will give you an idea of what it's like for that police officer in that community. And then we can dialogue and come up with solutions that benefit us both. We are in this together. We cannot do it without the community. We and the community cannot be protected without law enforcement. They just can't. If they could, we wouldn't be here. Or we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here. It just wouldn't, because yeah. in our country, it doesn't work that way. But then you, there's other communities that literally has pushed out law enforcement. There are Hasidic communities in New York that I specifically, I know, that they have their own police, their own hospitals, and they are very internalized. They have their own little internal internalization problems, but they they really section themselves off. And, mm. and, and I don't think that idea is going to work. Yeah, how, how, how does that work? It, it works for them because they bought up so much of the land and so much of the schools because of the city community, the city Jews, they send their kids to their own schools, their own... And so they really... They get money from us, from the outside community, but they keep their money within themselves. Wow. So, and I've heard the rhetoric about, well, maybe we just need our own police force, or maybe we need our own this, and blacks need their own this. I don't think that, that would work either, because if that would work, then why we still have been a high rate of black on black crime? I was just about to say, when people talk about um, self-policing, <laughs> right, what stops you from doing it now? Right. You, you know, if, if it could be done, if, if it was something that people wholeheartedly wanted to do, we wouldn't have any crime because everybody would be policing themselves. Right. We know that in society, there are those who are not able to do that. And so you need the people like myself who are there. Um, and we're peace officers first. I know that people say law enforcement, but my role it, it first is to be a peace officer and then a law enforcement officer. Um, I want every interaction, when somebody has an interaction with me, I want it to be a positive one. Now, there are going to be some times where you're not going to like me. And it's going to be probably because I'm there to arrest you. <laughs> but even when arresting somebody, that doesn't mean that I have to treat you less than human. Right. You know, and I'm, and I'm very careful about how I treat people because I can always be on the receiving end of that one day. Well, it just sounds like your training was, maybe you took your training a little bit more seriously, maybe your training was a little bit better, and because all training aren't the same. We know that. It's not. Yes. And, and, and that's something the, the American people don't understand, is why yes. isn't there equal training across the board, because I know tons of police officers, and they're very skilled, and then I don't know the others, because I, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know the others. Man, most of the police officers I've ever come in contact with is we, we come to the martial arts community, and, and, oh, and, and so okay. the way they carry themselves, the way, and, and also from ex-military, so... Uh -huh. All training isn't the same, and so we got to stop thinking that all officers are the same. They're not. And here's the thing. Every officer comes from a community. Right. We're not, like, in a lab where you're creating this perfect <laughs> law enforcement officer. So when you have, there's going to be people in a community that are not good people. There are going to be some officers that slip mm -hmm. through the cracks that are not good people. The, the problem is we have to do a better job of weeding them out and making it extremely difficult for them to go somewhere else. I mean, that's the way you change the culture in law enforcement. You make it unbearable for a person who's a sexist, a racist, homophobe. You make it very unbearable for them to be in law enforcement. And then you make it extremely difficult for them to leave your community and go to another. Right. You know, we just got to hold them accountable. You ought to have your own talk show. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, I know, I'll leave but that up to you. <laughs> because I don't think we hear enough of this, and and that doesn't help people. Also, and maybe I don't know where people get their news from, and hopefully this gets to where people hear. But they don't hear enough of what it is and what the blessing it is. They only hear the like you said. We only hear the negative and the rhetoric of of the negative. Well, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Yeah, that's true. People say they don't want negativity, but what do we we fluctuate? We 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 want to look at negative stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. That's what sells. So, um, you know, I try to do my part. I'm, I'm in my own little bubble at the 6th Precinct in the city of Detroit, and I try to make that area better than when I left it. You know, my, my goal as a leader is to create other leaders mm-hmm. within and outside of law enforcement. If I, if I can have a child that has watched me in a community that comes to me that, that I watch go through middle school, high school, mm-hmm. and go to college, then I know I've won. Right, right. Yeah, you know, and, and, that, and that's my goal. My goal is to touch someone. I can do what I can for who I can when I can. Well, I want to say thank you for all the ones who support you, police officers around the country and the globe. Just thank you for all the compassion and passion you have. And please, be safe out there. Tell your husband be safe. Tell your precincts to be safe. Everyone should be safe. I just want everyone to be safe. And, And be cognitive of what you're thinking. If I can get people to think before they do, then we would have less crime and we would have less Absolutely. less death. Because the way this is going, death is rising, whether it be a COVID, whether it be a crime, it's just rising and rising. And there's there's too much blood in the streets as is. And um, um, the only way to stop blood is to stop it. I mean, we just have to stop. Absolutely. You got to put a tourniquet on it. I want to have you back later. I know you're busy. We'll keep this. Uh, I'll, I'll text you and talk later. But everyone off the air. So if you want to get a hold of you, if they want to get a hold of you and just say thank you so much for your service, is there letters they can send to you besides Santa Claus? Where can they reach you? <laughs> they can actually reach me um, the Sixth Precinct um, Police Department. We have a Facebook page, so we're at the Sixth Precinct Detroit Police Department. Um, they also can reach me at the 6th Precinct, which is located at 11450 Warwick, and it's W-A-R-W-I-C-K, that's Detroit, Michigan, 48228. I will make sure I get that put in the in the links and stuff, and thank you so much. I'm going to pray us out. Do you have anything else you want to say? I just want to thank you for even giving me this opportunity. Um, I didn't know what to expect, um, and I really enjoyed myself, and I hope that whoever's listening to our dialogue that we left them with something to think about Me you know too. how they can better their community wherever it is that they work thank you so much thank you thank you Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for allowing our words to be heard. Thank you for allowing our passions to be felt. Thank you for protecting all those who are in service in our community. Serving you, dear Lord, and your Heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. And thank you for your service. Thank you. I volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.